Good evening. Welcome to the, another episode of Fresh Natural Live. I'm here live from Houston, Texas, and we're going to have a nice little discussion on um, issues related to, um, I hate to use the word, the F word, but fraud in medical research. Uh, I came across this uh, article uh, regarding Department of Justice uh, criminal inquiry into an Alzheimer's drug research. And so it made me reflect on, you know, a lot of issues that we deal uh, with in medical research. And, um, you know, I'm not going to bring up certain, you know, drugs that are recently used in certain, you know, worldwide illnesses, but you know, it, it really came to fruition when we started dealing with some of these issues. And so what I'd like to do is um, open up uh, with a discussion about this research uh, inquiry. But what I want to do is invite my colleagues to join in and uh, we want to share our insight on this topic. And I think it's something that you really should uh, have insight to because many of the decisions that are made by the healthcare practitioners who are, you know, uh, taking care of you, working hard, is based on research that's coming from these sources. So uh, let's sit back, uh, get your pen and pencil ready. I think you're gonna get a lot of good information tonight. Okay, good evening again. And as I said, we're going to be talking about research and questions of fraud. Uh, as we get started, I want to remind you to hit the thumbs up button, the like button, and also share this information uh, because many of your friends and family members and colleagues will benefit from the things we're about to say today. I know that for a fact, even before you say it. So hit the share and the subscribe if you had not had time to do so. I am Delighted to invite my special guests, friends, and colleagues on tonight. We have Dr. Celeste Palmer. Dr. Palmer, how are you doing? I'm good. You're saving you? lives in the pediatric world. How are things there? It's busy because it's the beginning of the school year. Okay. But good. Well, hold down the flood of people headed my way as they get older. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Atkins, how are you doing, sir? I am doing wonderful today. How are you? Just fine, just fine. There's a rumor that you're in the States. Is that true? <laughs> uh, the United States of America. All right, all right. <laughs> welcome, welcome home. Well, anyway, as I said uh, in the uh, outset, um, we're going to talk about a Department of Justice criminal inquiry into Alzheimer's drug research. I'm really going to talk about this article, which is not going to be the core of what we talk about. Uh, this is a, a but as I understand it, an opening and ongoing investigation. But the reason I'm, I'm using this article really as an entry to an overall discussion I'd like to have tonight uh, with you and, and of course the audience about this whole issue of medical fraud, we're probably gonna take a, a poll. In fact, I'd like to take a poll with the people in the chat right now. And I'll sort of ask for repeat votes uh, uh, throughout and um, Dr. Palmer, help me keep track of the number of thumbs up and thumbs down that we get. I think we can do a thumbs up and thumbs down option on this. Um, do we have a thumbs up, thumbs down option on the reaction here? Uh, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll do a number one, number two. Okay. So for those of you who, and we're gonna, before we even say anything, I shouldn't have even given the title of the talk, but anyway, for those of you who have, um, um, greater than 50 percent trust in the so you know pat you're voting too early in the uh, <laughs> uh in the uh, pharmaceutical research the the big pharma drug research the research that comes from these new drugs and medical device so medical device and medical drugs if you have greater than 50 percent trust that it's legitimate not fraudulent given number one if you have less than 50 percent uh trust that it's not fraudulent or shady in any way, given number two. So favorable, number one, 
not favorable research, uh, lack of trust, number two. And uh, just vote only once if you, if you uh, will, please. And uh, Dr. Palmer, if you kind of keep score for us as we go through, and if you can try to vote before we start talking. <laughs> so, so favorable is number one and not favorable is number two. Okay. So anyway, so there we have our early voters. And one thing, um, uh, common counselor had opened up with this, you know, bomber of a question that I don't know the answer to, but do nursing homes get money for data sent to the research and therefore hide what they're doing to people? Now, um, I guess they will hide the bad things and not hide the good things, but I don't know if that's true. And I don't know, any of you, are y'all aware of what nursing homes do, uh, Florida Celeste, in terms of- No, I just, research? I think that I think they may, if they can enroll their clients in some kind of clinical trial for a drug study, that's the only way they would get money. I don't know any other way other than that. Yeah, yeah, that that's my understanding. Drug studies are probably either way, but but that probably feeds into what we're gonna talk about now. So let me just share my screen. I've got a couple of little um, PDFs with some highlighted things. So basically the US uh, Department of Justice reportedly opened criminal investigation into cassava scientists just one week after neuroscientists alleged in, a, in an expose that the company's studies of the exper experimental Alzheimer's drugs, simifilum, excuse me, appeared to include altered images. Now with, uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease, you, you, it deals with, of course, disease of the brain, and you're going to be dealing with before and after data uh, where you will be looking at before and after MRIs of the brain or CT scans of the brain. And so there's an allegation that there were some altered images uh, in the before and after. In response to the Reuters report, uh, Remy Barbier, Bar Barbier, President CEO of Cassava, said in a statement that no charges have been filed against the company and that allegations of research misconduct are false. Now, you know, it's an interesting statement because um, to open an investigation, uh, you may not necessarily uh, file allegations. So what he's saying that there's been no formal civil suit filed in the court or no indictment filed in the court. So uh, there's no formal uh, allegations made and so basically saying the research misconduct, the allegations are false. So that's, you know, a denial, a denial there. Uh, most recently, uh, Matthew Scragg, uh, MD, PhD, an Alzheimer's researcher with Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, alleged that an expo in an expose in the journal Science that it appeared Cassava's research included altered or duplicated brain images that have appeared in dozens of journal articles supporting the uh, efficacy of somifilum, Scrag filed a whistleblower's report with the National Institutes of Health, which has spent millions funding the drugs development. So now, this Dr. Scrag uh, has whistleblowers, whistleblowers protection. And so, you know, that's protection against, you know, the company coming against them, et cetera. And also, uh, if there's money uh, uh, retrieved by the government, then the whistleblower will receive some of that. So there's, there's an upside to the whistleblower being a whistleblower. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the motive of the whistleblower. I'm just saying that, that I just want to, you know, get that understanding out there. And, and, and again, as more people sign on, we have an ongoing poll uh, to vote. Number one, if you have uh, greater than 50% trust that the uh, research by big pharma and big device is legitimate or not fraudulent. And two, if you think less than 50% less than chance uh, that you're confident that's not fraudulent. So in other words, two, you don't trust it. One, you trust it. So let's vote. Don't vote. If you voted already, don't vote again. Uh, but anybody who's just checking in, not aware of what those uh, votes are uh, meaning, that's what we're voting on. So, um, so you have a whistleblower who's made these allegations. So that's brought about uh, the Department of Justice uh, created an act for them to now go and investigate. So there's a whistleblower report or allegation, Department of Justice is now opening an investigation. Uh, and that's pretty much how it goes. Now, uh, again, the whistleblower has certain protections and also is an upside for whistleblower. But, but it's, 
this investigation is not um, a major uh, part of what I want to discuss, other than the fact that it raises the suspicion in this particular drug that is raised often and in many cases have been proven. And before we open the floor for discussion, what I want to do is go to, and I just pulled this other article uh, about how Merck manipulated the science about the drug Vax. Um, and uh, you, uh, Floyd Celeste, y'all remember the issue with Vioxx or is that, I mean, it's, I mean, there's a lot of drug issues out that, you know, I don't know about or remember, but I remember this one because I was one of an army of cardiologists asked to uh, review, you know, you know, hundreds of pages of, uh, you know, hundreds of documents and articles and uh, uh, on uh, the issue. And uh, we were, um, there was a large uh, law firm here, in Houston, which I think is nation as a, as, a, as a national firm, but I think we were on the defendant side uh, back in the day before I was, you know, wearing the white hat. But uh, I guess I was wearing the white hat then too, but I just wasn't aware of all this bad stuff going on. So I guess I was working out of ignorance. Uh, Dr. Ford's smiling there. But anyway, what happened then is that uh, Merck eventually settled outside and paid um, tens of millions or maybe a few billions of dollars. But what they did, uh, what was found, there were five business tactics, uh, business five tactics of business interest uh, use and sideline to sideline science to see the public. So some of the things they did were one, uh, to increase the likelihood of FDA approval for the anti-inflammatory and arthritis drug Vioxx, the pharmaceutical giant Merck used flawed methodologies biased toward predetermined results to exaggerate the drug's positive effects. Now, let me just pause there. Now this sentence, I, I think, this sentence is a little bit of an understatement, largely because it says to increase the likelihood of FDA approval, they did, you know, X, Y, and Z. You know, one thing we have to understand is that the FDA receives a very large chunk of its budget from pharmaceutical and device companies. So Big Pharma essentially contributes a lot through fees and all of the other things. And so I've, I've heard estimates around 40% of their budget, it could be more, it could be less. But a very significant chunk of the FDA's budget comes from the people whom they're regulating. So I, I want us to get a grip on that because we, if 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 I'm driving on the street and, and technically, you know, I pay taxes, and so the police officers who work for me, you know, we, you know, I contribute to the taxes, but I'm not a soul or one of maybe 50 people who pay 40% of the, you know, income of all police officers. If I were, you know, a recognizable person that paid 40% of the income of all police officers, then um, it'd be understandable that um, a police officer would stop me and recognize me if, as a contributor to their, you know, income and, and think twice before giving me a ticket or, or something like that. And I think it's, it's this kind of environment that the FDA, who's policing Big Pharma, recognize that Big Pharma as a whole uh, contributes greatly to their budget. So I think that's a backdrop you have to understand as we go through this. Now, so then in addition to that underlying fundamental backdrop, the increase of likelihood of FDA approval was anti-inflammatory drug virus. They, they use flawed methodologies biased toward predetermined results. As part of the strategy, they manipulated the trial design by comparing the drug to naproxen, a pain reliever sold under brand names such as Aleve rather than to a placebo. Now, if you take a drug, new drug, and compare it to an old drug, there are benefits and, and there are pros and cons to that. The, the pros from the standpoint of the new drug is considered is that the old drug has side effects too. So if you have a new drug that works in a similar line of activity of biochemical pathways, then the side effects of the new drug uh, could be very similar to the side effects of the old drug. So the increase in side effects or adverse reactions will be blunted because you got two active drugs that can cause problems. So that's a favorable part of, of comparing it to an old drug that could have side effects, maybe more side effects than a new drug. 
or as many. Uh, the, the potential negative aspect of the new drug, as we'll talk about here, is that the old drug may have some positive benefit that the new drug doesn't have. And as it turned out, um, the drug Vioxx uh, is what we call a COX-2 inhibitor. It, uh, uh, it goes down one of the pathways of inhibiting uh, anti-inflammatory uh, or, or inflammatory reactions uh, in the body's biochemistry as opposed to having a balanced effect. Uh, you have COX-1 and COX-2. That's a very, very uh, simplified explanation. Um, naproxen has a different mechanism. Naproxen behaves more like aspirin, um, and it has a pretty strong antiplatelet effect, and it's been found to reduce heart attack by 80%. Now, the interesting thing here is that Vioxx increased risk of heart attack by 400%. So when you compare it to a drug that decreased the risk of heart attack, and you have one that increased risk of heart attack, what they did, you would say, well, gosh, that seems like that would be bad, but they hid the data, the increased amount of heart attack data was hidden, and, and that the, the FDA just did not see that data, and also the science of reviewing just doesn't see the data. So essentially hired, hid the data, that's one. And then they upplayed the, the fact that naproxen uh, decreased heart attack as a benefit of naproxen, but Vioxx did not you know, increase heart attack. So they hid the increase in heart attack in Vioxx and emphasized that naproxen decreased heart attacks where Vioxx didn't necessarily. So that's, they kind of hid it by two ways. Um, they also use a pattern of ghostwriting of scientific articles. So in documents reveal, so what ghostwriting is, you get somebody who writes. So basically you may have a staff person who's one of your hired writers and they will simply get the data from the, the scientists and then they would write according to what the executives want them to write. And so they'll write out the uh, background the results and then the discussion, which is the most important part, which is the interpretation of the findings. And so you have the findings, you kind of manipulate the data, you leave out certain data points and you have uh, the data, the findings that you want. You say, okay, we had a, you know, um, um, increase in this or decrease in that and the bad stuff you leave out so you don't make an interpretation on it. And that's essentially what was had here, but they also had employees who were writing the article. So they use ghostwriters, but they don't publish the name. So Jane Doe, who works for Merck, wrote the article. And Jane Doe is a great scientific writer. She's, you know, maybe a master's degree, a PhD in scientific writing or whatever. And she's a Merck employee, as opposed to having an independent medical expert, a scientific expert who reads the journal and interprets it and then comes up and writes based on their opinion. You have somebody who's hired by the company who's writing what the company wants them to write. But they're, they're not exposed, so hence the, the term ghost. They're the writer, but they're a ghost writer because they're not, their name is not on the paper. Uh, what they do is they go to institutions, medical institutions, and they get some of the leaders in their field, uh, maybe uh, leaders in the field of rheumatology or whatever the case is, and say, well, we want you to be you know, primary authors on this. They get paid money. They'll look at the data that's made available to them. That's not all the data there is, just the limited data. Then they'll look at the article and they'll just say, yes, you can put my name in this. If they disagree with the study that's done, the only thing they can do is just decline to be an author. They can't go out and publish anything against um, the um, uh, company or anything like that. So they probably sign an NDA just to be able to look at the data. Uh, internal documents revealed that 16 of 20 papers reporting on clinical trials of Vioxx a Merck employee was initially listed as the lead author of the first draft. This is what I'm talking about. So they have one of the employees of the first draft. On published versions, an outside academic was listed as a primary author. So basically, before they get it published, as I said, they get an outside academic and say, okay, you can uh, look at this. Do you agree? We'll pay you, you know, $20,000 to put your name on the article. You don't have to do anything other than that. And your reputation, Dr. So-and-so, um, chairman of such and such department at such and such, you know, uh, as prestige institution in the United States. And so they become the author. Uh, then, uh, and some, the other four external author was listed. So they still didn't disclose the name of the ghost author. 
Strategy of Merck's manipulation of its data and the FDA's resulting approval of Vioxx in 1999 led to thousands of avoidable premature deaths and 100,000 heart attacks. The Senate Finance Committee that the FDA's failure said that the FDA's failure to recall Vioxx earlier, because they knew about these increased cardiovascular deaths, I think after maybe a couple of months after the publication, uh, but they didn't recall it. They left it on the market. Their failure to recall it uh, earlier when they knew about these findings resulted in as many as 55,000 premature deaths. So they knew about the increased deaths. They hid the data and did not act on the data. And they estimated 55,000 premature deaths or heart attacks and stroke uh, were attributed to that uh, negligence. Uh, calling the equivalent of allowing two to four jumbo jetliners to crash every week for five years. So mm. what Merck did is they shot down four jumbo jetliners every week for five years. Uh, and they just got a slap on the wrist. So, so anyway, that's pretty much what I have in terms of the data. And uh, what I'd like to do is get um, anybody and everybody's comments on this um, in terms of, of um, uh, what your thoughts are. I have a few other comments, but I thought I'd just open the floor. Uh, Dr. Floyd, Dr. Celeste, and the members of the gallery, any questions or comments? And uh, we got the bombshell question up front. Um,